Hi, everyone. I'm Sue Hilliard, and our newest speaker for EA Zoom meetings today is jo Joanne Borlais. She's an author and a former professional ice skater, as well as a graduate of Soulwise Astrology School. Her website is joanneborlais.com, and I will put her contact information into the description of the video. Welcome, Joanne. Go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Sue, for the wonderful introduction and much gratitude to you, Robin and Jordan, for being here and everyone else that's been able to attend. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's an honor to be here to present this very brief overview on two important elements in astrology called phases and aspects. And I was inspired to do something a little bit different um, to try and show in physical form how natural laws and nature correlate with the astrological phases and aspects. And at the same time, I'll still refer a bit to human psychology as well, using the two planets being Venus and Pluto, which are the Scorpio, Aries, and Taurus uh, Libra archetypes. And um, you're also going to notice in this presentation how um, these phases um, also have much in common with the moon's monthly eight phase cycle being from the new phase to the crescent phase to the gibbous to the full phase. And then there's the disseminating last quarter. Oh, I forgot the first quarter. <laughs> there's also first quarter gibbous full phase, uh, disseminating last quarter, and then the balsamic phase. So I'm no orchardist or gardener or botanist, and I'm eons away from being an expert in astrology. Um, I'm still a student, a uh, very humble student, still learning. So please forgive me if I've not done enough research here. And also, please feel free to share your thoughts and opinions um, on whatever you think or feel. Um, so this is part one, four, and I'll be going through the four quadrants, also known as the four seasons, while reflecting upon the apple tree's growth life cycle. Um, I won't go into anything technical or math or calculations. This is only a very basic overview of the energies, and I won't be mentioning every aspect either, just the main ones, no signs really, just keeping it very simple and won't be actually looking at a natal chart or a sinistry chart or anything like that. It's just all very simple. Um, I'll be focusing mostly from the Northern Hemisphere's perspective, but I'll mention a little bit about the Southern Hemisphere too. So, so let's begin. Um, in looking at the hemispheres briefly in astrology, oops, I went too fast. Um, you'll notice that the uh, Earth's orbit around the sun is not perfect, and neither is the solar system nor the universe in time space degrees. Um, with these northern southern hemispheres, uh, June 21st marks summer solstice in the northern hemisphere and winter solstice in the southern hemisphere. Uh, that's due to the Earth's tilt on its axis and the sun following along the ecliptic path. Um, this is where the sun's warm rays and life force peak in the northern, while in the southern, the sun's warm rays and life force pulls away, giving the southern hemisphere their colder months. And almost as if the, the warmth and the light rises through the earth and emerges in the north. And um, the light in the south will be minimal. And in the north, we get the longest day of the year. On December 21st, this marks winter solstice in the northern hemisphere and summer solstice in the southern or northern and southern in the southern hemisphere is winter solstice. Um, so uh, it's much colder in the northern hemisphere, and we've got the shortest 
uh, darkest day of the year with the least amount of daylight. And in the Southern hemisphere, the sunlight and warmth are peaking and giving them the longer day of the year. And life is buzzing, bustling about down there. It's as if all the sun's warmth and life force from the Northern hemisphere where it was has sunk deep into the soil, traveled through the earth and it's emerged and arrived down under in the South. And uh, the trees in the North fall into a slumber and hibernate. Uh, and though all the sun's warmth and energy is still around the earth, it's still here. It's just that it's gone South. So the reason why I'm emphasizing these two hemispheres is that there is something in um, in um, that's very sim similar. Uh, they're, they're wet temperaments, they're wet times of the year. So whether it's Cancer or Capricorn, you're still going to get a similar temperament. And Cancer, this is on the Cancer Capricorn axis. So we've got Cancer, it's summer, it's rain, you know, up in the northern, and in the winter time, we've got snow. Either way, there's high precipitation going on in both hemispheres at the same time. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, you know, the summer we've got the wet with the rain, and then the winter, there's whether it's the north or the south, there's the snow, which is in a more solidified form. And uh, yeah, both are equal wet temperaments. Um, of course, all plant life relies on seasonal changes too, and how those conditions are to survive. So if colder temperatures last longer, the tree's going to develop later. And if warmer temperatures arrive earlier, plants and trees will obviously bloom their buds, flowers, and fruit earlier. And this is what to expect and how the energy plays out in the seasons. And many of the photos, not all, but um, many that I'm using are going to be from the Northern Hemisphere perspective, uh, I believe in the UK. And um, special thanks to Darren Turpin, who's a professional orchardist and gardener who permitted me to use many of these photos. They're beautiful. And um, also thank you for his knowledge in which he was kind enough to answer many questions that I had. Um, so uh, the apple trees development stages in the photos that I'm going to be showing, they may be off by a few weeks or a month uh, seasonally, depending upon other global locations. But this is mostly research done and a presentation to reflect the, the astrological phases and aspects and not the actual precise dates of when an apple tree growth occurs. That part's all up to mother nature. Um, so uh, just moving on in my slides here. Um, this is very common knowledge, but I just thought I'd do a little bit of an overview on it, um, how uh, plants are highly intelligent beings, how they, they eat from the nutrients in the soil. They also eat insects. Uh, they drink water. Um, they also drink the sugar, like in the form of sap, they re-energize from that, uh, or the starch. They have hormones. They um, they rest and sleep as well, which is dormancy. They also bleed and suffer cuts and wounds through their sap, uh, which is you know there's a lot of uh, intelligence here that connects with humans, and they store carbohydrates uh, like. Um, starch and sugar for energy. They also breathe, which is their respiration uh, through lenticels. So, um, you know, you can see, I don't know if you see my mouse here, but um, uh, there's these yes. little specks, the white specks dots um, on uh, fruit or on the leaves. You can kind of see them a little bit in here. Also in their, uh, the bark, uh, the tree bark, uh, the branches, they're all over. And that's how they um, they they process uh, respiration. Um, so they breathe through these, they're like tiny pores. 
and process is where oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide uh, for photosynthesis to occur through the sunlight. Even roots require oxygen, which they can get from small air pockets within aerated soil, which is significant for their growth. And during the colder months, the respiration declines and the air exchange is through the soil and the roots. And during warmer months, respiration increases through the bark, branches, stems, leaves, flowers, and fruit. Um, so they, interestingly, also respond to their environmental stimulus and can sense things. And the uh, significance of this is the archetype of Taurus, uh, which is about the five senses. So they touch um, through vibration, electrical impulses on a molecular level. There's also a scent that they give off, which, is, which attracts insects and helps in procreation. Um, they feel, they feel warmth, and they feel cold. So they they know temperature of um, when to break dormancy and when to enter dormancy, hibernation. And they're also sensitive to light and darkness through photosynthesis and dormancy. And um, another thing that's fascinating is they communicate with one another secretly and silently especially when threatened or struggling, and they have a language of their own through signals, vibrations, scents, and pheromones, and they use their root system to communicate. Um, there's a website also providing evidence of this called the uh, Wood Wide Web, www. So you can find all kinds of fascinating information there about um, this communication uh, skill that they've got. And um, apples and the trees, they have healing properties. Uh, for example, an astringent, an apple cider vinegar for those suffering from ailments such as colon issues or also in healing through herbalism. And they're full of antioxidants, vitamin C, etc. So I just wanted to touch base on all of that, because I think that it's important. It uh, really reflects the Taurus archetype. Uh, so moving on, um, another thing to uh, consider here is the alchemical reactions uh, that create and sustain life. And so in astrology, it's not just, you know, the signs or the planets that or the houses that we look at there's also the elements the modalities uh and qualities um the temperaments the temperatures and the opposing complementary forces so with the elements we're looking at the basically the uh the, the uh, fire signs the earth uh signs the air and then there's the water uh, then we come into the modalities, which are the cardinal, fixed, and mutable energies. There's the temperaments, which um, I also made a, a certain note of on my slides. Uh, the tolerant houses, which are fire. The phlegmatic houses, which are the earth signs. Um, the sanguine houses or signs, which are air. And then the melancholic uh, ones which are water. And then we also look at temperature, which is hot and dry, hot and wet, cold and dry, or cold and wet. And the opposing complementary forces that um, are also significant in the astrology is the nocturnal yin passive cool forces um, versus the diurnal yawn dominant and hot forces. Uh, so yeah, we don't usually use the feminine or masculine anymore. We use yin or yan. Hopefully I, I pronounce those right. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, those are very important, um, especially in nature. It's all about the chemical processes going on. Uh, so I, uh, moving on to this next slide. Um, I took these photographs and I just want to point out that evolution and consciousness are not linear. And as you can see, there's an overlapping of um, 
of, you know, these seasons going on. So this was summer when I took the, the photographs and you can see all this green leaves and life force bustling around. And um, when you look down on the ground, you can see all the decay still happening. And this is from last year, possibly the fall. And even when I look over here in this, this picture, I think this could even be two years prior. So um, again, evolution and consciousness are not linear. They're overlapping. And, um, uh, you know, you, you have to kind of look at the fact that even though there's things within us decaying, um, there's new things that are being rebirthed as well. And, um, you know, it's, it's that Scorpio archetype type of death and rebirth happening here, which is all part of the past, the present, and then moving into the future. Um, it's all like this dance of life and um, death and rebirth. And so, you know, you, you have to kind of consider that even when a building is being structured, you know, the building's going up, it may look and appear in its process from the outside going up in a linear fashion upward, but there's all kinds of stuff going on on the inside. And sometimes they'll have to take out a floor and redo it or redo the walls or, you know, so there's always these layers of structuring happening in nature and also in our own consciousness, human consciousness. Um, so in moving on, I, I just, yeah, I just really wanted to reflect upon that. So um, there's a lot of symbolism and mysticism about the apple tree and apples, which is really fascinating. Um, it's, uh, it's about the in looking, there's lots of things I can say. I, I mean, I can talk about the macrocosm, microcosm, as above, so below, which I've got illustrated here. But there, there's going to be later on in my other parts where I'm going to show different, um, uh, different aspects of the symbolism and mysticism. I, I think I might have spelled mysticism wrong. Anyway to be a C, <laughs> not an S there. Um, but, you know, there's there's lots, like there's the Adam and Eve story, there's the Snow White story. I'll be getting to a little bit more of those. I just thought that this part of um, the, my presentation would be quite suitable because it, there's, you know, looking of the, uh, the above and the below processes going on right now in my presentation, which I'm explaining. Um, so, uh, whoops, I went too far. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, we've got the tree of knowledge here and the tree of life, um, how it correlates with the philosophy of as above, so below, um, so that what's occurring in the celestial spheres also impacts the terrestrial planes, um, and for example, the moon's effect on the monthly cyclic tides is true evidence of this happening, these forces going on. Um, we're also living in our own reflection, the outer life mirroring the inner life and vice versa. And then there's cause and effect playing out with the macrocosm, microcosm, as above, so below, uh, resulting in our karma. And then, uh, you know, with the human body, we've got like the head or the brain is like the top part of the tree with all its nerve cells in the brain. And then we've got the branches uh, and, and the leaves are like the human arms and fingers. And then the trunk being the body and then our legs and toes represent the root system of a tree. And um so the microcosm and macrocosm, it's basically being the big or outer world versus the small and inner world and how they inter interrelate, they intersect and overlap and impact one another. So I just wanted to throw this next slide in. Whoops, Johnny Appleseed. <laughs> 
He's his name is really John Chapman, and uh, he's a blessed soul. He was born here sep September 26, 1774, which is um, interesting because Pluto was in Aquarius then, and um, he helped populate apple trees throughout the U.S. And I I picked this slide or this picture here because I I didn't want the pan on his head. <laughs> which he's so well known for that, uh, that picture. Uh, he didn't wear it on his head. He had it in his knapsack attached to it. Um, so I thought this was a nice, respectable picture of him. And um, yeah, so moving on. Um, so getting to these slides here, I just want to say uh, thank you again, Sue, for this chart, loaning this to me or giving this slide to me of the phases and aspects. So here there's 300 and 360 degrees going around the chart. And uh, we've got the four quadrants. So we've got like the ascendant, the descendant, and then we have the MC and the IC. And each sectioned off as a quadrant. So this is spring, summer, fall up here and winter. And within each of these um, uh, quadrants are the eight phases. And this is where the moon's monthly phase cycle comes in a little bit as well. And each quadrant contains two phases and several aspects, as you can see. Um, you know, the aspects are these things here. And like I said before, I'm not going to do every single aspect. It's way too much, too long. Uh, so I was just going to concentrate, whoops, uh, focus on um, the two new phases here, the new phase and uh, the crescent phase. And um, I've got the moon also just to show how this would appear in the sky. And usually new phase, you can't really see the moon when it's just changed, um, transition to uh, birthing a new moon. It's it's invisible in the sky, but as it slowly, the days start to pass, you start to see the small little, um, like a fingernail uh, crescent, and then it enlarges a little bit more and we get into the crescent phase. So, uh, yeah. Um, so this is the new phase it's a gateway and it's transitional this is known as the conjunction there's a lot of potent energy here and the key word i use or that i i found in my research online is called power and this is aries it's and this is a very very arian energy uh, very Aryan aspect. It's fire, cardinal, hot, dry, choleric, diurnal, and yawn energy. And it marks spring. And this is where there's a new evolutionary intention and initiating a new beginning. Uh, this is the ground that's cracking open. New life is pushing upward. The insects are emerging and the bees are also waking from hibernation. This is a spark of life. It's an instinctual emergence and it's very impulsive and random. Um, it's self, self, it's about self and freedom orientation. And the apple tree and its buds, they contain all the DNA and blueprint needed to grow, uh, to become more than what it really is, uh, to become that uh, ultimate apple tree. And there's a tap root also that's already formed at this point. And the tree is surviving off of it right now. It's almost like an umbilical cord seeking nutrients and water within the soil. But yet it's it's here. It's 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 arrived. And it's got this identity oriented energy of like, who am I? What am I? And there's this desire to discover in this energy of what this who or what I am is about. Um, also, uh, although the Aries energy can be quite violent and powerful in birthing life, uh, there's a fragility to it as well during this time. And 
as you can see, there's this uh, tight cluster early to mid-April around this time. You can see this Aries glyph. You see the Aries sign in the life as it's, you know, it's like peeling open. And um, in this, whoops, this slide here, we've got the threat of, you know, frost or snow that can delay growth or even kill, uh, damage or kill these new buds. And um, and then here uh, we've got like the, the buds that are, they're packed inside. They haven't sprung yet, but they're packed inside here in this bud in a tight cluster. And we usually get around two to six buds. The first one in the middle cluster is the king. And it's the most important. The rest usually when you're doing, um, you're growing an apple tree, uh, the rest get pinched off. And uh, moving to the next slide, um, this uh, I thought this was a, a significant showing too of the Aries archetype. Um, you can see in the first, the, the to the left, uh, the bright green dewy tendril just emerging and initiating itself as it's fighting its way through the soil from the seed, which is quite a feat for such a young fragile being showing its strong Aryan warrior impulse to push through the soil against gravity that's holding and pulling it back down to the ground. And this tiny sprout is just birthed its way out of source or mother's womb, which is Pisces, and uh, is beginning its evolutionary journey fueled by instinct. And you can see it, you know, the growth happening um, in this uh, second slide to, it's the middle one, uh, it's cupped. The tendrils inside are trying to push their way out. Um, so th yeah, this is like all, um, it's an, an unfurling process and it's very restless and it's also skittish and a, very much a vibrational impulse process going on. And the roots are also interesting in that they mainly grow downward to the pull of gravity, which um, where the stems, you know, they grow upward through, wow, uh, I think it's called phototropism, phototropism, I think that's how you pronounce it. And if you try holding a stem down during its, especially its early stage growth, it's still gonna try to grow upward toward the light because of a hormone called oxen. oxen. Um, so there's a lot of power in these little shoots that are just coming up and, but they still got that fragility to them as well because, you know, they haven't lived all along, but they've got that blueprint. And um, yeah, again, you can see the, uh, the Aries glyph opening up here as the apple seed the seedling, the leaves are just coming out. Um, yeah, you can see them right in here, these little leaves uh, emerging. And again, the Aries glyph showing here. Uh, so yeah, moving on. So that's the, basically the conjunction phase. And then um, moving into the next, uh, or not the phase, the uh, aspect, the next aspect is the semi-sextile. So here we've got irritation. It's uh, Taurus is beginning here. It's got this Aries essence still going on because it's got that new phase stuff. Um, but, you know, it's now earth energy coming in. It's fixed, cold, dry, melancholic, and nocturnal. And the yin is being stimulated by the yawn energies. And so we've got this burst of random energy in the new phase, uh, which begins slowing down. And it's trying to uh, slow and shape itself and structure of what it is. And so there's this balancing and the structure happening. Uh, a lot of control is necessary to harness for a specific pur purpose. Uh, the seedling begins to sense again, uh, that sensing Taurus is coming in. It begins to sense certain directions of 
where to act and move towards. And uh, this is also a stage of budding promise in discovering its new evolutionary intention. And when we look at the um, the uh, the flowers here, uh, you can see there's like this budding promise in discovering its new evolutionary potential. Um, the honey and sap is also starting to flow here and the apple tree's flower fra fragrance is emerging, attracting bees for pollination. And again, Taurus, that procreation impulse going on, um, which is also part of the uh, Taurus archetype. Uh, the smell, which is one of Taurus's five senses, uh, smell, which is part of the Taurus archetype as well. Um, so yeah, with the procreation impulse, Taurus, grafting is usually done in late April or early May, depending on climate and mother nature. Um, so yeah, this is where you get pollen from another other tree sources uh, to produce the fruit. And basically, if you were to take a seed from an apple and try to plant it or grow it into a seedling and then plant it, um, you're not going to get this, not likely to get the species you want. It's like a maverick um, that you'd be going for, but uh, you don't really know, you know, what kind of apple is this? And it may not be as tasty as the ones you get at the supermarket. Um, so that's why we do or there is grafting to uh, produce the kinds of species that you want. And again, you know, going back to the procreation forces happening here. And uh, at this point, the tree sap is also beginning to flow. It's um, the perfect time for uh, the grafting to occur. And an apple tree that doesn't get grafted, it will not likely produce much fruit for about 10 years. Uh, whereas a grafted tree will begin to bear fruit within about three to four years, maybe even earlier. Um, so generally, apple trees can start to be grafted when they're around one to two years old. But, you know, they say it's important to wait um, so that the tree is big enough and sturdy enough to support the weight of the apples and also uh, survive the stress of the grafting process, too. Um, so moving on, this is the crescent phase uh, coming up now. So this is a new gateway. It's like a doorway opening up for a different type of energy to come in. And we're looking at the aspect of semi-square here. The key word is frustration. And uh, it's very Taurus. Uh, again, we've got the earth fixed, um, full, dry, melancholic, nocturnal yin on, on uh, energies happening. Um, so the seedling to the right, it's really, really grown here. And um, it's trying to slow itself down and root something. Uh, but this new form is also what's happening inside is it's stimulating further growth within the tree. And a certain amount of isolation is needed to integrate what's been discovered. So in the prior, uh, I was showing you also when we've got the branches happening with the new buds blooming, uh, it's basically there's this new thing that's being discovered, which is apple buds. And so, you know, you've got these flowers that are really starting to bloom here. And when you're seeing all of this, you can see like there's this meaning coming out um, this valuing of what it is of, of this new growth. And, you know, it's really coming into picture and uh, manifesting a purpose in its individual way. And there is some kind of a cherishing to it as well. And it's like the apple tree is showing off its pretty blooms and it's also giving off fragrance into you know the air and so that it can be picked up by the bees so you know nature in a way is kind of flirting with itself um yeah and uh there's almost this withdrawal here too so although there's this emergence happening um there's still 
this withdrawal where there's inner growth that's taking place as well um, from the past ways of being in the new phase. Uh, it's giving out a further individuality here. And uh, there's a reliance on its own resources because Taurus is also about self-reliance, self-sufficiency, uh, survival. Um, so the tree is actually feeding off its own sap, its sugar for energy to, you know, uh, make these blooms come out. It needs a lot of energy for that. And um, within these flowers, you know, there's, there's still, you know, the growth, the external growth is, it's becoming limited. Like what else can it do? Um, and of course, evolution is just never ending. It's a constant process, um, always in layers. And so with the external growth um, being limited now with these flowers that are out here, um, there's something that, you know, is going on inside of them. Like why, why did these petals come off? You know, um, there's this petal drop that is starting to occur. You can see it happening here. Their, their petals are drying up. Um, so also during this time, um, a gentleness is required with these blooms uh, because flowers <clears throat> Excuse me, I just have to take a drink here. Um, flowers are also a source of food for animals. And um, so there's this gentleness required because these flowers and the tree can become a victim of pest, disease, uh, injury by animals or humans, violent weather and wind patterns, and also... Uh, animals that come around and start eating these flowers and buds. And so, yeah, these branches are, and buds are very fragile and tender in their first first few months uh, or years, like the, the tree that's slowly growing. And uh, um, so, yeah, moving on, we've got uh, the petal drop here that's actually even in a deeper process here. And this is the sextile where there's opportunity. Uh, that's the key word. And this is very Gemini. It's air, mutable, hot, moist, or wet, uh, sanguine, diurnal, yawn here is stimulated by the yin energies. Um, so there's this prior internalized action, which is the Taurus part, providing that's provided because it's done some work here, uh, ease for the next stage of outward growth. But also a laziness can occur here. And so there's this petal drop, it lets go its petals, um, but then there's something underneath that and there's a new discovery, a discovery of what is uniquely individualistic, that's emerging fruit, that's started developing. Um, thus, this is the new evolutionary purpose, which is to bear fruit. And, you know, um, the wind here is also at work. Being Gemini, it gets a little bit windier and drier this time of year. Uh, the wind helps to strengthen the branches, the stems, the trunks, uh, during this time of year as it moves through the leaves and um, uh, you really see uh, also the green. The green is beautiful in June. You start to really see how vibrant it is. It's like this hawker's green color comes out. Um, and, um, whoops. Um, and I'm just showing over here one to two year apple tree. So during this time, the uh, the branches that come out the blooms and buds they're very precious they can be eaten or chewed off by deer and um, a lot of times they're cut off or pinched off if there's any plumes to help strengthen uh, the tree trunk and also the branches so that the next couple of years we'll be able to hold the apples um, and then here this is just like a first whoops a first year seedling here blooming its leaves that are fluttering in the wind and it's a, the time of Gemini you really see a lot of a lot of movement and Gemini is a very restless 
energy. It's it's constantly on the move. Um, so I'll move on to the next slide here. Um, yeah. So the quintile, this is the last aspect I'm going to cover. Um, the key word is creativity. And this is a time of, you know, being cocooned. Something's starting to show. So you can see the fruit is even emerging further here. Um, it's not just this, you know, going back a slide here, these tiny little buds, they're starting to grow and, and enlarge more here. Um, it, this is a very creative, transformative time of the existing structure where there's something better than what it was to come out and basically the fruit being a source of food for nature. Um, so here the tree has become highly individualistic with a futuristic purpose, which is the fruit tree, the fruit. Uh, it's getting ready to take action. Um, so, you know, in Gemini, this is mutable energy. There's um, a lot of change processes going on a lot of transformation potential and the same way um, there's, you know, in cell growth, tremors occur. So if you were to look at a cell, even a human cell, um, fertilized cell, uh, you can see it does this little tremor or this little wiggle uh, before it starts to split, change or mutate. Well, in nature too, all the uh, mutable signs, uh, mutable houses, they they are uh, very restless energy. They're, they're, um, there's like this um, uh, this movement, this wiggling going on, and it's a nervousness and uh, unable to sit still. Um, and uh, yeah, so looking at, again, we see this as above, so below, which is you know, the Gemini, Mercury, Hermes, Toth, uh, the push forward, pull backward, that's going on with this quintile. And um, that's what happens with this wiggle upward, downward, upward, downward. And so it's kind of going up and then wiggling this way. Um, it's trying to break out of its current structure. And um, Mercury is also known as the psychopomp of above and below. He takes the story of Persephone and Hades. He takes Persephone and the dead as well into the underworld. And so he's in two places at the same time as shown here in the Tree of Life image, um, which is, you know, a duplication that is taking place as well as above, so below. Well, Mercury, um, the god Mercury, he's as above, so below, and he is the the planet Mercury is the ruling planet for Gemini and the third house of, you know, with all this stuff going on. Um, and so I'll just move on now to the next slide. So I'm going into now the Venus and Pluto energies, the archetypes here. Um, in this, um, you know, you look at Venus and Pluto, and I chose these because it's Scorpio and uh, Taurus, and Pluto represents the soul, and Venus is um, the polar point of Scorpio being Taurus and uh, represents all kinds of things like um, love, beauty, the arts, uh, it rules two signs, Libra and Taurus. So that's where we get into love, beauty, the arts, music with Libra, harmony, balance, um, relationships. Uh, they are excellent negotiators, counselors, mediators. Um, but there's always this pleasing others and being nice too, which is can be a problem. Um, there's equality, justice, sharing, and in Taurus, we're looking at the self-worth, the self-values, self-sufficiency, self-reliance, um, my money, possessions, talents, and abilities, what you possess, um, procreation, survival, archetype as well with Taurus. And then we go to Pluto. Well, what's Pluto about? Um, Pluto 
is Scorpio. And then if you look at the opposite of Libra, you're looking at Aries, Mars. So with Pluto, you're looking at power, control, sexuality, abuse, dominance, uh, magic, mystery, the mystical or the occult, uh, confrontations and limitations, uh, elimination, uh, transforma transformation and metamorphosis. So I'm, I'm not going to go into all these traits and um, energies much more, but, you know, with Mars too, you're looking at um, basically, oh, could be, you know, anger, um, this action orientation, initiation beginnings, um, yeah, the anger impulse, the uh, the violence possibly too is there. It's got potential for it. Um, the uh, the just the impulse to uh, uh, to be and of in life and just you know go forward without you know taking any pre planned steps. Just do it. Um, that's very Mars and Aries. Um, so basically looking at these charts here, we've got the new phase. So we've got Venus and Pluto here. Um, I decide to look at it from a relationship perspective. Um, basically when these two archetypes are playing out together, it's kind of like at the beginning of a dream in a relationship. So there's this triggering in a very deep and intense, meaningful way. It's exciting, very much like the new phase, but also insecurities start to emerge um, because it's new. You don't know what to expect. It's very unknown. Uh, suddenly the person is so significant to you, yet you don't know exactly why, uh, but there's just this intriguing, blind, pulling you to uh what this other person's about and there's a little bit of darkness too a little bit of mysteriousness in this feeling um it's kind of lethal and you can't resist it you you're there's just this compulsion or feeling compelled to investigate to pursue it um and it's not light it's not you know happy go lucky feeling it's um it's very intense and powerful and so here there's this deep emotional intensity and desire to keep that intense first attraction feeling going on and continuing and if it's not and it starts to die there's this panic that can also set in and it's these insecurities in a relationship that begin to set in in the beginning um uh, so there's also this subconscious desire for transformation through one another um it's sensed and that's i think it's silently sensed it's felt and uh, there's a strong sensual quality which is the taurus and the sexual component which is scorpio uh, the attraction there, especially for passionate and intense sexual experiences. Mm -hmm. And the other person feels like the ultimate other, like there's no other person for you. Uh, they are the one. And so, you know, it's very firm. Right? There's this feeling of, have we met? And so that's Venus and Pluto coming together. It's really, really intense passion uh that you're gonna see and kind of like love at first sight it's it's so intense um so it feels quite exhilarating and exciting you suddenly feel uh you've met the right person of your dreams this powerful magnetic connection um and uh sexual energy and it's like a tap root of something deep that can grow and become more than what it is. And it feels huge from just that little connection, that little talk room. It's, it's immense. Um, so that's the conjunction, what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, what it's like, uh, just from experience. And the next one going into the aspect is the semi-sextile. So you've just had this initial um like wow connection and 
now the energy that was running really high, it begins to slow down and settle down a little bit. And so there's this desire to focus it now, to um, bring it into something more, to try to tame or classify the energy into something specific, like, could this be a relationship? Can we make this a relationship? Um, such as, you know, talking about going to meet up for, or let's go for a coffee or go get a drink or, you know, this getting to know the other stage, getting to know um, person better. And it's, this is basically a desire for substance from that initial meeting. So I, I see that as a semi-sex style. This is a soft aspect, but it's still important. Um, and as I mentioned here earlier with Taurus and Venus entering, um, there's those self-worth issues that come up and self-value components uh, that are here to be expressed. Um, so a relationship is basically forming at the semi-sex style point. I would not say it's forming at the conjunction. That's just the meat, um, like the explosion. Uh, the semi-sex style, I think, is extremely important. There becomes this we component to it. And um, the energy that was random, it's starting to narrow and ground through sensing. So you're kind of sensing each other where you're at. You're feeling each other out, which is very Taurus. Um, trying to figure out a direction to go towards discovering what the evolutionary purpose of the initial meeting was about. And this is like there's some budding promise of something more here. Um, it's like that time of courting, of giving flowers, the dressing up, uh, being on your best behavior during this uh, this phase. Um, so I'm going to go to the next uh, the next one here. So that that's basically the new phase. Um, yeah, the conjunction and the new phase going into the uh, crescent phase, which begins here at about 45 degrees. Um, this is uh, where there's um, a lot of Taurus going on at this point. Um, the semi-square, it's, uh, it's another gateway. And um, this is kind of like, um, it's very important. It's like the collision of energetic directions. It opposes the opposite in Scorpio, which I'll get to later on, the Seska squadrate aspect. Um, that will be later. Uh, so here, in the semi-square, the relationship is beginning to become more serious. And more often than not, one person in the relationship begins to struggle in making it legitimate. Uh, so that's that phase that you begin to go through. And the seriousness of the relationship kind of creates fear and a resistance. Uh, sometimes this is where one partner will want to run away or withdraw or needs some space, some time. Um, and uh, so this can be a slowing down, intensifying energy in order to sense and ground and root deeper what the relationship is for and about. And I think if you push here, because it's Taurus, it's the bull, there may be a tendency for the other partner to not budge much. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Taurus Scorpio archetypes are fixed energies. Uh, there can be a stubbornness coming out here or a frog in the well syndrome, uh, you know, where the frog, he sees the sky, he sees his initial immediate surroundings, but he has no idea that water's about to come into the well. And so he feels very safe, but um, and will not move until he has to move. And so the soul here at this point uh, is likely struggling to move away from that initial freedom stage that it had in the new phase. And it's just struggling with not having that kind of freedom anymore. Now it's kind of being pegged down and it's, it's trying to adjust to all of that. 
Um, so yeah, moving on, we get to the uh, sextile. Um, so that's around, that's in this, uh, I think actually it's right here. Um, it's at this uh, junction point. So um, at the sextile is the beginning of the Gemini. Um, I, I didn't really give a good marker here, so I'm sorry about that. I'll just kind of point it out here. Uh, so it comes around this area where Gemini begins this line here. And at the sextile, this is a time of opportunity. There's some ease of energy emerging, but also there's this need to do something with it and to value it. And um, so it's not that much ease. There's some kind of effort that has to go in. And being Gemini, it allows for some movement. Um, and at this stage, there's this deeper understanding that comes in. Uh, it helps deepen and grow the relationship to, for it to find harmony and an inner balance of its own. Um, and Gemini is, is the mind, it's Mercury, it's, um, it's about communication, understanding, logic, it's about talking, um, you know, uh, it's also learning at this point uh, that the relationship also is beginning to have its own skill. Um, it's kind of like that tricycle I once talked about in another time uh, where you know, you've got the two wheels, they're on the side, and then you've got that big wheel at the front, which is the relationship. So it's getting bigger and bigger, and it's it's moving forward. It drives the relationship. So it's kind of like an entity on its own. And um, so it's like a, a system is being created here, and that's very much uh, Gemini, Mercury, third house archetype. Um, that helps the relationship to function on its own and move forward. And between the partners, there's going to be more communication happening, more logic coming in, um, more kind of more of a free movement. Some things are settling in a little bit here um, and opportunities for the couple or the two people to grow their relationship further. And um yeah, and then we get into the quintile, which is, I, I think it will probably be around, I think it's probably about this aspect, or sorry, whoops, uh, it's around this point here, um, might be around in this area here, uh, yeah, the quintile. Um, so I found this aspect a little difficult to research, I didn't find a lot of information, but um, I'm just guessing on, you know, my own experience. Uh, it's basically a lot of creative romance or creative transformation happening here in how this quintile aspect functions. Um, and it's, again, that tricycle dynamic going on. And it's ready, it, it, it's, it's ready to break out and move forward to something more than what it was. But um there's there's this pullback um it's unable to move forward it's kind of like it's stuck and um i'm thinking maybe maybe there's a disbelief in the relationship that it's lasted so long or um maybe it's stumbling through some of the myth mistruths that could be emerging in the communication um, so there's like this stuck and go feeling happening. Um, and the relationship at this stage could be looked at as almost having a mind of its own too. And um, yeah, so I've um, so I've kind of come to that part. And uh, yeah, so I've pretty much gone through everything here. Um, I'm just uh, concluding now. This is the first quadrant that I've basically covered of uh, my presentation of phases and aspects through the apple tree. I'll be presenting the second quadrant soon. And um, I hope you enjoyed this and were able to get something out of it. And um, if you have any uh, 
any questions um, or comments that you'd like to make, you can, you know, um, contact me. Uh, let me see here. Where's the, I don't know where my, sorry, I think, where was this? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. I wanted to thank, um, I'm just looking at my notes here. Um, I just, I just wanted to thank you for your time, uh, for coming out and much gratitude again to Sue, Robin and Jordan and uh, the EA Zoom meeting team. I uh, very much appreciate this invite. Um, I want to thank my magnificent teachers at uh, Soulwise School of Evolutionary Astrology, uh, in particular, Rose Marcus, for all of her wisdom, her guidance, and her support. Um, and also thank the Jeffrey Wolf Green Association of Evolutionary Astrologers and the Jeffrey Wolf Green School of Evolutionary Astrology um, and other evolutionary astrologers and astrologers abroad. Thank you so much. Um, also, I'd like to thank Michael Zesis for always uh, his continued wisdom, his continued guidance, support, and friendship. And I just want to say uh, thank you again to Darren Turpin, a professional orchidist and gardener who's in the UK, um, for his kindness in answering all of my questions and providing me with research on the apple tree and his beautiful uh, photos of the apple tree, which um, he let me use. Um, which most can be found on his website here at um, orchardnotes.com. And um, yeah, uh, if, um, if you'd like to contact me, oh, sorry, I've got, uh, also, I just wanted to mention here too, uh, here's some schools, books, and resources on evolutionary astrology, or just, you know, evolution of the soul in general, that I highly recommend and uh yeah so that's that's pretty much it um thank you thank you so much joanne that was wonderful it there, was there? it was really good joanne <laughs> thank you yes. thank you very Thanks very so thought provoking yes it's a lot of information that yeah, is but that's the beauty of these is people can go back and rewatch them, you know, um, you did an amazing job. I feel like I love that you put this together with natural law. Like even your Aries glyph was amazing to me. <laughs> I'm looking forward Thanks. to part two. Yeah. I, I really tried to, uh, I tried to show that. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I have, uh, I have my coordinates here, I think. Um, uh, if anybody's interested in contacting me, um, you can uh, send me an email or uh, contact me through my website or through my uh, YouTube channel. Yeah. Awesome. Yes, and we'll, we'll put all of this information in the description of the video so that um, okay. people can contact you. And we will look forward to part two, three, and four. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Thank you.